Uh, I'm introducing for the second time here today, uh, Rebecca Ann Heineman. She was actually the champion of the first national video game competition. In addition to that, she has extensive history in computer programming, which is what I know her from. She's a developer of many well-known games, and particularly well-known for extremely high-quality Apple IIGS work, which is incredible. Again, not this discussion, but still amazes me, and I still play your bird scale games you've worked on. So, Again, please give her your attention. Um, it would be very interesting, and again, we were just talking about it. There's a lot to know about early game competitions and how companies interacted with their fan base and how that happened before the Internet. Uh, welcome. Okay, and it got there. We go. The technology, it works. <laughs> um, once again, I'm here speaking in front of the uh, Vintage Computer Federation East 2022. Um, I'm Rebecca Ann Heineman. I've been in the video game industry since the beginning of time. It really, you know, I kind of cried when the dinosaurs died, but <laughs> what can you do? I mean, Noah was, was adamant. We were leaving at three. I mean, come on. <laughs> but my story began a very long time ago. Um, first, in the dawn of video games, we had Space War. We had... Um, Colossal Cave and so forth. And these computer games were all done on computers. We were using, you know, big mainframes, big, uh, you know, mini, what they consider mini computers would of course be about the size of this desk here. Um, but eventually in time, they miniaturized them all down to single boards that were all made with discrete logic. So you really can't call them computer games because there wasn't a computer in it. Because most Pong games, they used hardware, you know, you open it up, it's just TTL logic in there. But in time, a company called Atari thought, hey, let's go ahead and rip off what Fairchild is doing and make a cartridge-based video game. Yeah, Atari wasn't the first. It was Fairchild. I love my Channel F. But in time, Atari started making video game cartridges such as like uh, Combat and uh, Outlaw and so forth. But then one day, they've managed to license this game called Space Invaders. <laughs> well, during the time uh, the Atari 2600 came into being in 1977, there was no such thing as the internet. There was no such thing as um, BBSs even. So the only way for Atari to reach out to the people who played their games was to create a fan club. Um, I believe it was called Atari Force. Um, but what you'd do is that you'd buy a cartridge, inside of it would have like a little registration card, and sometimes it'd also have like a little mini comic book or something that would say, you know, put in your name and address, send me, you know, one, two dollars, which of course, you know, back then was like about five, six dollars, and then you would join up with the Atari Force fan club, in which what they would do is they would send you flyers every few months, um, and with coupons and things saying, hey, you know, why don't you buy the loose games coming out? Get in line now. Um, see, for me, is that I was going to a store called, I think, Fedco. Um, and there was another one called Gemco. Um, both of them are gone, you know, rest in peace. Um, but that's where I would buy video game cartridges occasionally. Um, most of the times, I was pirating them, and we'll get to that. But the Atari company managed to acquire the rights to Space Invaders, and they thought, you know what? This game is going to sell millions of copies. That case, they were right. You know, of course, they didn't repeat that later on with E.T., but that's another story. So they thought, wouldn't it be cool if we had a video game competition where we would have kids all across the nation, you know, in this case, the United States, because let's face it, we're still, even now, so kind of xenophobic, but they would say, hey, everybody in the United States will have five regionals, and each of the regionals would have a winner, and would give them an all-expense-paid trip to New York City for the finals. So one day, a friend of mine, who happened to also play video games with me, um, he got the flyer, and it had the big Space Invaders logo from the a video game cartridge, and it says, coming soon to Topanga Canyon Plaza. 
at the Topanga County Plaza at some time on, I think it was October 10th, 1980. Um, no, yeah, October 10th. Yeah, I think it was October 10th. I have to look at my calendar. But come to Topanga Canyon Plaza, where if you pay a $1 entry fee, you can compete in the National Space Invaders Tournament. And of course, my reaction was, <laughs> I'll, get, I'll get creamed. I'll get absolutely creamed. And why did I even believe that? Because I was raised in a really, really crappy family, and I had to run away from home. I had to um, stay with friends and so forth, because here was this 15-year-old uh, going on 16, was really you know, broke as heck, and the only way I can actually play a myriad of Atari games was bumming time off my friend's uh, collection. But he was totally insistent that I was going to be a video game champion at this contest because for some strange reason, we always played a game called Slot Racers. Uh, Slot Racers is a two-player game in the Atari in which essentially you were just driving this little vehicle and you shoot bullets and you can shoot them around corners and stuff and strat with strategy in the maze and uh, wipe out your opponent. And uh, he made it his quest, his life goal to destroy me in this game. And much like Lucy and Charlie Brown, as Charlie Brown keeps running up to the uh, football, I would just yank it away from him and go like, okay, I creamed you. Okay, I creamed you. And it was like we did this for months, in which every day I would come in there, we would play easily 20 to 30 rounds of this game, and every time I would destroy him. And I still thought, nah, I suck. <laughs> But then again, you know, my family kind of destroyed my self-esteem at the time, another story. But he was insistent, absolutely insistent, I have to go to this championship. So I said, okay, fine. So the day comes, so I believe it was a Saturday. Uh, again, I have to look at my calendar to see what day October 10th fell on, but I believe it was Saturday. We drove down to Topanga Canyon Plaza which is called Westfield Topanga today, but you know it's been 41 years. Got into the, this shopping mall. Many of you may remember them now, considering they're all being turned into Amazon warehouses or something like that these days. But there, they had these uh, circular, like cylinder kiosks, which on the kiosk, they would have like one Atari on one side, another Atari in the other, and there was like about 20 of them. And there was like 40,000 people there. Because Atari, in their infinite wisdom, when they came up with this idea around a table, much like this, saying, let's do this video game competition, they had no clue what this was going to become. Because when they first did the, the very first uh, regional, it was held in San Jose, California, and they thought 5,000 people was gonna show up. It was 20,000. So the next regional they were gonna do was going to be in Los Angeles, sorry, no, take it back, it was in Chicago, Illinois. There was like about 50, 60,000 people show up. At this point, Atari, no, let's take it back, 40,000 people show up. So Atari's like, oh boy, um, we only brought enough personnel for like, you know, 5,000 people showing up. So the lines were all the way out the way. So when I showed up at the LA Regional, they did hire a bunch more people and got more kiosks that they basically just stole from a CES display. Um, but here it is, cordoned off. We then went there, I gave them $1, they gave me the ticket, got in line, and the line moved really fast because Space Invaders, they decided to play on a hard level. Game one, B difficulty, and if you do the double fire cheat, which is you start the game by holding down the reset button, then you know, turn on the computer, whole reset, turn on the Atari, let go of the reset button, it will then let you fire two shots instead of one. That was instant disqualification if you did that. So, I never practiced the game with wide uh, bases, because they never said anything about it. They just said, come to the Space Invaders tournament. We weren't going to tell you that we're going to play on hard. But undeterred, got to watch the line going, because the average time somebody was playing Space Invaders at this difficulty was about 30 seconds. 
They go in there, start moving, and because you're so wide, you can't evade the shots, <laughs> gone. So, got, on, uh, got my turn, went up to the ki uh, kiosk, gave the guy my ticket, and I says, okay, let's do this. Reset, start the game. Dun, 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 dun. Okay, but then again, you know, being a 16 year, 15 year old at the time, uh, was it 15 or 16? It was definitely underage, definitely minor. My reflexes and the fact that I played so many games of slot racers, my reflexes were razor sharp. And I just was playing the game, playing the game, playing the game, playing the game, playing the game. <laughs> and I was just going to the guy who was me and said, so, um, how long have you been playing? Like an hour, okay. <laughs> How's the weather? How'd you get this job? What's going on here? Yeah. So, it's, but, you know, you know, did you travel very far here? Yeah, I came all the way from Whittier. Yeah, it's like a 45 minute drive. So it's, it's, yeah. Is there anything else we could talk about? <laughs> I am really bored. What is it, like an hour? Well, how many? <laughs> what the? Oh, damn. The alien has landed. <laughs> What's my score? Uh, tally, 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 tally. 8,000, no, 88,000 some odd points. Is that good? I guess like, <laughs> I don't know. So at that point, he then pulled out a little sheet of paper which says, I competed in the Atari 2600 Space Invaders tournament. Your score is 88,000 some odd points. And he hands it to me and I go, okay. Start wandering away and I thought maybe I should go get an ice cream or maybe sit down. Because when they were playing this game, you were standing at this kiosk. There was no chair here because they thought, yeah, you're only going to be standing here for three minutes at most. 30 seconds, if you, you know, the vast majority is 30 seconds, you're out of here. So, of course, I then, standing there with my friend, who was like, oh, where have you been? And I'm like, I've been playing the game. So, like, what do you mean playing the game? I, I got out of there like an hour ago and I'm waiting for you. <laughs> So then we're like, let's go get something to eat or something to drink. And just before we're about to leave the area, I get a tap on the shoulder. It's someone from Atari, and it was going like, um, you're Heinemann, right? It says, yeah. Do you mind if we not post your score right now? And I'm like, why? Because you doubled the high score, and um, <laughs> the third place is like only 10,000 points and we don't want to scare people away from playing this game because they're you know, raising money for charity or something. And I'm like, fine, because I'm expecting someone right now beating that score because you know, who cares? I'm not gonna win. So I wander away, get some ice cream, you know, and then like about uh, 45 minutes later, it's time for them to wrap this up. So we get back to the area and there's one guy playing on the Atari 2600, everyone, every one of the other kiosks is empty. The reason? Well, after three minutes, pretty much everyone's gone, but this guy was actually doing it. And I'm like, oh, well, I guess there's the winner right there. Nope, the aliens got him. What's the score? 24,000 points. <laughs> so I'm like, well, um, okay, so who's the winner? And that's when Atari says, okay, and the winner is Heinemann from Whittier, California. And I then looked at my friend, he's just jumping up and down like crazy. And I'm sitting here like, is, wasn't there a mistake? That can't be me. <laughs> and he said, nope. They came up to me and says, hey, you're the winner. You get this uh, um, all expense paid trip to New York City for the, uh, for the finals. So get your name, your address, your phone number, all the other stuff. And I'm like, okay, here's my name and address. I don't have a phone. Like, oh, well, do, how about your parents? Okay, my mom has a phone. Here's my mom's phone number. And uh, that was that. So we drove off. Two weeks later, I totally forgot about it. Totally. Now, due to my circumstances, I actually moved back in with my mom because at that moment in time in that game, I was not living anywhere. I was basically living behind a dumpster. But went to my mom's house. I was living there, setting up everything, and then all of a sudden this package arrives, this big um, uh, overnight envelope. And inside of it is a one, oh, sorry, a round trip ticket for one to New York City with an itinerary and everything. 
And I'm like, whoa, this is real. They're actually sending me to New York City. Cool. Um, so I then look at my mom says, Mom, do you want to come with me? So it's like, is there a ticket for me? No. Then her answer was, yeah. <laughs> it's, it's not like we could even afford it. We were barely, a, my mom was barely able to make thing, uh, ends meet at the time. So the idea of buying a plane ticket in 1980 was like, no, that, that's not happening. So I said, fine. Um, what am I going to wear? What am I going to do? It's, like, it, it's not like I've ever flown anywhere in my life. It's not like I've gone anywhere. So I went over and I bought, went over and got a, uh, a cheap suitcase from Goodwill. Um, then just got some clothes. But my mom really did want me to look nice. So we went over and got me a nice, some nice slacks and a, a shirt. But it was like, that's pretty much all the clothes I had other than a couple of t-shirts and jeans and tennis shoes, which is not that far from what I wear today. <laughs> so this, uh, one of those airport shuttles show up at the house, get in there, go to the air, uh, airport, uh, you know, walk up to the gate because back then, you know, you could actually walk to the gate, not because, you know, terrorists is the reason why we can't have nice things. Got into the 747, it's like, oh my goodness, this airplane's interior is bigger than our whole house. <laughs> and got to get in the plane, got my plane ride, flew over to uh, New York City, and then that's when I walk out, uh, you know, had to ask around, like, where's my suitcase? Like, oh, it's a baggage claim. Well, what's baggage claim? <laughs> it's that place. So. Got my bag, then I found this gentleman in, basically in a suit and tie with a sign that says Heinemann. And so I was like, um, I guess I'm supposed to go with you. And he goes like, great. And he goes, where's your parents? You only gave me one ticket. His eyes bugged out. How old are you? I says, 16, actually, I'm gonna be 17 soon. I think my birthday's coming up. It's like, uh, oh. <laughs> So he then takes me in this uh, limousine, literally limousine, drives me over to this hotel, where then they escort me to this hotel room, which was interesting because it actually had an Atari 2600 in there with the Space Invaders cartridge. So fancy that. And I'm just sitting there going like, okay, um, I am now over 3,000 miles from home. I have no clue where I am and um, no idea what I'm supposed to be doing. But then I had a knock on the door, and it was somebody from Atari, and what they did is they brought all the contestants together, and they took us on a tour of uh, New York City, and they took us to this really fancy restaurant, and I was always noticing that the Atari people were murmuring to each other as they were looking at me, because the other four contestants each had at least one parent with them. I was the only one there by myself. So, of course, I overheard them saying, you know, legal's going to be having a shit fit about this one. <laughs> I was like, Didn't anybody think about that? <laughs> so, afterwards, the very next day, they told us a part of our itineraries after we're going to get breakfast, we're going to go take, be taken to, I think they called it Building 30 Rock today, but back then they called it the Time Warner Building. So, the Time Warner Building, they took us, it was at 10 o'clock, they picked us up from the hotel, Drove us, it was like maybe four blocks, to the, uh, to the um, Time Warner building, where they took us, I believe it was the fourth floor. I'm pretty certain it was that. But then again, my, this is 41-year-old memories. I'm just basically playing what happened in my head uh, as I'm speaking. They took us in a room that was not really that much different than the room I'm standing in right now. It probably was a bit smaller. And they had the chairs, just like they have here little folding chairs, and in there was the press. People from the LA Times, the LA Herald Examiner, the New York Times, the Washington Post, and of course all these myriad other newspapers, plus this interesting company called CNN. Because you know they just came into being and they're, one of the first things they wanted to do is, hey, there's this national video game tournament, let's go ahead and do it. And they thought, wouldn't it be cool if we did running commentary? Obviously, they've never played Space Invaders before. <laughs> oh. 
But of course, everybody in that room was told the idea that this game's, this whole contest is gonna be over in 15 minutes. Because unbeknownst to us, they had told all the press that this was gonna be sudden death elimination. The game's gonna start, and as each one gets knocked off, that's how we're gonna fig figure out the order of the prizes. First one out, fifth prize. Next one out, fourth prize. So on and so on and so on. Well, when you have five kids from five different cities who each one in their respective regionals turned in scores of over 50,000 points each, the concept that this game's gonna be over in 15 minutes was a pipe dream. <laughs> And that's what happened. Of the five contestants, there's myself from Los Angeles, a gentleman by the name of Hing Ning in San Francisco, or actually San Jose, but he actually was from San Francisco. There was a gentleman by, uh, I don't remember his name right now, but he was in um, Dallas, Texas, uh, Steve Marmel from Chicago, and finally, Frank Tetro was the most recent winner because he won his region only a few days before in New York City, which that one, they had over 100,000 people playing in that particular contest. So easily, there was well over 250,000 to as many as 300,000 people participated in the regionals across the five cities in the United States. And then, as an aside, the gentleman from Chicago, I don't know if any of you have seen the movie Pixels, the one from Adam Sandler. There was one character who was played by Peter Dinklage, who comes in with an entourage and so forth. That was the gentleman from Chicago. <laughs> he literally had this T-shirt from some electronic store um, chain in the Chicago area. And he was already doing merchandising deals with these guys. That had he won the Space Invaders tournament, they would have run a whole slew of commercials with him in it as their spokesperson. And he was just all bragging about his score and bragging about his deals and so forth. And I'm like, dude, <laughs> chill. <laughs> Karma is a bitch. <laughs> Because we began. The announcer went up the, onto the stage. They had the five of us, each with a TV up top, the Atari 2600 below, and each of us had a T-shirt which had our names in the back plus what city we were from. So mine's the Heinemann, Los Angeles, et cetera. And of course, because they wanted the press to see the TVs, the TVs were above our heads. So when I played, I had to do it like this. Because, you know, instead of the TV being at eye level, which would, of course, be blocked so that the press can't see it, it was up here. So that took a little bit of adjusting, but, of course, after an hour and 45 minutes of play, you just don't think about it. So the announcer told everybody, here it is for the first annual Space Invaders Tournament. <laughs> yeah, that, that worked out. Um, we all pressed the reset buttons. Hit hold your reset buttons. Go. And of course, for the first 30 seconds, the games are all synchronized. So that was kind of creepy, where this, all the space of air is going dun, 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 in five but one sound. <laughs> but then, and of course, then when the UFO came out, yeah, it was, that was all synchronized. It, it kind of gave you a little headache there for a moment. But then, after the first clearing of the board, we all then were all different timings, so then it started sounding more like a video game arcade. So it was just like random beep beep bop bop noises. Except for those two commentators who were probably about maybe 10 feet behind me, going, and now the contestants are going there, so the space invaders are going, what kind of place are they going to do? Oh, it looks like they, oh, almost got hit there. Oh, that person got, almost got, like, like what's, what kind of technique? I don't know what kind of technique. Is. And after about five minutes, they started slowing down, and they started realizing, this is pointless. <laughs> 20 minutes in, boom. Steve Marmel of Chicago was no longer the king of Chicago. Wow. Last place was, here you go, here's your golden crown of uh, you know, uh, leaves and dried brush. So he was like, oh, he was out. The other four of us, 
dun 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 for one hour and 45 minutes. And it was just dun 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 dun. At this point in time, as you can imagine, if I was just standing here going dun 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 and I did this for one hour and 45 minutes, I would have almost all of you either out of this room or totally asleep. Imagine that's the opinions and ideas of all the press, because they're just sitting there going like, well, I've got a lunch appointment. When's this going to end? When's, like, I, you know, I got to go to the bathroom. And then I, later on, I found out several of the press actually were like doing the dance in their chairs because they were afraid that if they got up and walked out to go use the restroom, they'd actually miss something. So they were going like, uh, uh. well, eventually the guys at Atari realized that, hmm, we didn't think this through. <laughs> so then, unannounced you know, to us anything, I just heard the announcer come up and says, and so concludes the Atari 2600 Space Invaders Tournament. <laughs> We're still playing here, mind you. Like, we had no warning, no nothing like that. Just like, and so concludes, the judges are now leaving the room to tabulate the scores and blah, blah, blah. And it's like, I'm sitting there going like, well, um, does this mean I can stop playing? And he goes, yes, you can stop playing. Oh, thank God! <laughs> I just grabbed the cartridge, yanked it out of the 2600, I put it down on the table, and I just sat back in my chair going like, oh, it's over. <laughs> and I was like, bring back. <laughs> because, you know, when you're, when you're playing this game, you know, you, you get into a zone, and time has no meaning. But your body is still telling you, I have an itch. I have a crick in there. I need to use the restroom. I could sure use a glass of water. None of those things were available. We did not have glasses of water in front of us. We did not have anything in the rules which said, you know what, make sure you use the restroom before you start this game. Um, thankfully for me, I didn't need this, but I think the guy from Dallas, as soon as they found out that the game was over, he got up and said, where's the men's room? <laughs> and he was gone. Thank goodness. Well, afterwards, the judges were then coming back in, the announcer was getting ready, and they had us um, sit in a, a little semicircle as they were going to be starting announcing the prizes. Now, context. The prizes for this contest, the, uh, video, the Atari 2600 Video Game Championships, the grand prize was a stand-up Asteroids game. Second prize was an Atari 800 with all the fixins, printer, disk drives, software, cartridges. Third prize, here, have a Atari 400. Uh, and the fourth and fifth prizes, like, here, have some money and a kick in the butt. I was looking at that Atari 800 going like, I could sure use an Atari 100. I love the Atari. I mean, I haven't, I just got this Apple II at home. Um, I've spent my entire life savings on it, but I really, really, really would like an Atari 800 because it has a disk drive. <laughs> I was still saving my stuff on cassettes. <laughs> so, of course, fifth place went straight to uh, the guy from Chicago. Not, no surprise there. Fourth place, Dallas. Fifth place, sorry, third place went to um, Frank Tetro of, uh, of New York City. And at that point, <gasps> That means I'm getting the Atari. I'm getting the Atari. I'm getting the Atari. And the Atari goes to Hing Ning. And I'm going, shit, shit, shit. God damn it. <laughs> and then it's just, I just freeze. It's like, wait, what? <laughs> and the grand prize winner and the National Space Invaders Tournament champion is Heinemann. And I'm like, but I wanted the Atari. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so they put me, um, they, they took me aside, put me to the, a back room, and had me change my t-shirt to this white t-shirt with an Atari logo, and on the back it said, National Space Aviators Champion. They had me come out, and then we spent the next 15 minutes taking photos and people shoving microphones in my face saying, so how do you feel? And I'm like, I have nothing. I, I still want the Atari. <laughs> <laughs> so after... All that was over. I then uh, had to take the people from Atari aside and said, um, you're sending me an asteroids, right? Yeah. You do understand that I don't have any space in the house for something like that. I don't 
we don't even have a garage. <laughs> like, where are we going to put that thing? I go like, well, uh, that's the prize. He says, well, can you substitute it for a Missile Command tabletop instead? And I go like, sure. It's like, cool. So, so at that point, um, I then said, great. They then had more microphones shoved in my face. Um, some of the clips you may have seen in this show called, um, it's on Netflix, called Game Over, and I'm in the first episode. They actually had clips from CNN of the video of me being interviewed and some parts of the contest. It's like, oh my goodness, there actually is vi a video of it. But then, they then took me aside and said, um, where's your parents? And like, um, I don't have any. <laughs> and I'm like, um, because we need you to sign this release form and this paper to, to get your prize. And it's like, um, are you 18? Yes. Yes, I am 18. <laughs> oh, well, then no problem then. Sure. So I signed the papers, signed that stuff in there, and uh, said, OK, great. Um, they will then, let's get you out of here. And no sooner that I had those papers signed, and they took me to this place where they had like a meet and greet, which is where I met uh, Arnie Katz, Bill Kunkel, and Joyce Worley of Electronic Games Magazine. So got introduced to them. And at that point, they then grabbed me, tossed me into a um, limousine, and took me to the airport, and I was on a plane back to LA that night. Um, as I understood it, they were supposed to stay like one or two more days, but the thing was is that um, I'm not 18, and they don't want to be liable for me in one second longer than they had to be. <laughs> so, back home. Great, I'm home. Uh, my mom's like, so, what'd you do this weekend? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> So at that point, the phone starts ringing. Then I had reporters from the Whittier Daily News, the LA Herald Examiner, and so forth. They came in with their cameras, and they wanted to take pictures of me and my Atari 2600, which um, I had to borrow uh, from a friend, because I went to my friend's house to play the Atari. Um, I eventually bought one like a few weeks later, but it was like fun. So they had me take pictures of me playing the game, wearing that same shirt in my bedroom which was really small and it really annoyed the photographers because they're like, how in the world am I gonna take a picture of you when I'm only like four feet away? <laughs> but they managed it and then came the book deals. Oh boy. Um, they thought, hey, because she's uh, really, really good at Space Invader, she's obviously good at all the games, isn't she? So I got contacted by a book company and they wanted me to work on a book called how to beat the video games and how to beat the home video games. Um, a guy named Tom Hirschfeld, I believe it was, was the one who was actually ghostwriting the book and they wanted all my tips and tricks. So I was on the phone with that guy like, oh boy, like three or four hours a day for at least two weeks per book just saying, this is how you beat Donkey Kong, this is how you beat uh, Space Invaders, this is how you beat Centipede, blah, blah, blah. And of course, for me, is that I would go down to the arcade, play the games, have fun with it, and then come back and say, okay, now I know how to beat Centipede. <laughs> but after those two books were done, um, then I had Electronic Games Magazine contact me and saying, hey, can you write articles on how to beat video games? I'm like, I've never written an article in my life. <laughs> Time to learn. And of course, back then, in 1981, you don't exactly write down your documents and then you um, electronically send them. No, no, no. I had to get a typewriter, which thankfully we did have a typewriter, um, a manual typewriter, and I had to type everything in, of my, my uh, game story and stuff, which of course, because I was a terrible typist at the time, I would have to write this article like maybe seven or eight times before I finally had one that wasn't so full of white out, it wasn't funny. And then once it was all done, then I had to put it in a letter, put a stamp on it, and mail it to them. And then I would hear from them like about a phone call like a week or two later, saying, yep, we got your article, I'm gonna edit it, blah, 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 send it out. So I learned the ins and outs of how to write, how to learn a typewriter, um, and so forth by doing these articles. Well, during this entire same time, I was managed to able to acquire my own Atari 2600. 
It too was kind of like my Apple II, something that fell off a truck and someone sold it really cheap and I asked no questions. But my problem, Atari 2600 cartridges were expensive. They were $30 to as much as $50. And these are $1981. So that was a lot more money, especially when you're working at a gas station at JCPenney or the a warehouse at JCPenney, uh, making, I think it was like a buck and a half an hour or something like that. So as you can imagine, you know, a $50 cartridge represents almost uh, two weeks, uh, one to two weeks of pay. The solution. Buy a modem. Now, why would I buy a modem to solve the problem of no Atari cartridges? Maybe it's because I could shove that into my Apple II and go into the world of BBSs, which of course led me into the world of black boxing and tones because, you know, my mom was not going to be too thrilled about the phone bills. Because, you know, this is the time when they still charge you by the minute. So, you know, one month all it took saying, hey, um, why is the phone bill $120? Like, uh, I don't know. Um, uh, I don't know. Let's see, BBS, BBS, how to black box, how to, do okay. Go to Radio Shack, get the parts, go in here. My, hey, mom, look, the phone bill is only $5 now. <laughs> again, oh, again, well, magic. Despite the fact that, hey, why is it that you're always on the phone and what is this <laughs> sound that's on the um, receiver when I pick up the phone? <laughs> Magic. <laughs> well, thank goodness for Radio Shack and their breadboarding and their parts. Because the Apple II, thankfully, had schematics for all their peripheral carts at the time. This is something that I wish they would still keep doing today, but today it's like getting schematics out of modern equipment is like pulling teeth. But back then, it's like, oh, your integer card? Here's the schematics for it. I would look at the integer card and go like, hmm, this is a ROM chip. There's a RAM chip called a 6116 that all I have to do is just change this one line to be read-write. Otherwise, I could just plug it in as a ROM. What if I add buffers? What if I add other circuitry so that I can be able to, I don't know, take a cable, wire it up, take an Atari 2600 cartridge that I borrowed from my friend, and plug it in and read it into my Apple II. Then I could save it off to a disk drive, which I just managed to acquire, that fell off a truck. Um, yeah, there's a place called Advanced Computer Products, and uh, in California, and they had a big, big swap meet every week. Everybody was selling computer components. Basically, imagine the um, consignment table here, except um, the size of an entire drive-thru, um, in like a drive-in theater. It was heaven. And there were so many people out there who found things off the truck. <laughs> but with this new floppy drive, my modem, and this card I designed, I was able to download all these cartridges. And then, using this modified integer card, I had another cable, which I took a combat cartridge and, you know, may it rest in peace, became a cable, which then I could plug into my Atari 2600, and says, hmm, download slot racers. Upload it into the card, put it into 2600. <gasps> slot racers! Five-figure discount! Granted, it cost me about $200 for a modem, another $150 for a disk drive, and you know, a dollar a disc to copy them all. But hey, I'm now able to basically copy every single cartridge ever made. Well, that led me to, because I'm infinitely curious, I noticed that when I downloaded these cartridges and I actually looked at the code, I can read it. It was all 6502. Thank goodness that Atari chose to use the same CPU as Apple. Because with that, I then started looking at the code going, hmm, there's this game combat. There's these instructions here. What if I change this one by here? Wait, the background's in blue. Change it to this, now it's red. Ah, so that register must be the background color register. And in time, I was able to reverse engineer the entire 2600 instruction set, the entire register set. And I was able to write my own little demo programs because I was a curious little bitch. So then, 
as I was doing, because simultaneously as this was happening, every, every month I had to sit down for two or three days with Whiteout to make my article I had to write for Electronic Games Magazine. And of course, my editor would then call me up a little later to say, you use way too much Whiteout. Um, and then he was saying, yeah, you know, right now the biggest thing going on in the industry is everybody's coming up with a company. You've got Activision, you've got iMagic, you've got Quaker Oats for crying out loud. <laughs> They were all Milton Bradley, 20th Century Fox, and, and the list just goes on and on and on um, about companies wanting to make Atari 2600 games, but the biggest problem was Atari was not going to tell people how to program the Atari 2600. It was an ancient Chinese secret. So people who used to work for Atari were basically getting you know, $20,000, $30,000, $50,000 cash up front to quit their jobs at Atari to go work for these other companies to then teach their people how to program the Atari 2600 because at the time, in this time in uh, the United States, NDAs weren't a real thing yet, you know, non-disclosure agreements. So effectively, people would be you know, like the infamous first four from Atari would quit their jobs, form Activision, and their entire basis of their company was based on the knowledge they gleaned from Atari on how to program Atari 2600 games. To put things in perspective, they developed their Atari 2600 games using, like I think, a PDP-8 with a cross-assembler and terminals. And so what they did when they first formed their company was to buy PDP-8 and somehow, which fell off the truck, a copy of the assembler they used, and they built their own dev kit, shall we say, and we're making Atari 2600 games. So other companies were doing the same. You had this big mini computer, so forth, because they just didn't know any better. And here I was using an Apple II assembler, <laughs> using a ROM emulator, and I was making Atari 2600 cartridges. Well, when I was talking with my, ma uh, my, write uh, sorry, my editor at Electronic Games Magazine, I said, yeah, I make cartridges too. He's like, no you don't, you're just a kid. He says, no, here, I'll show you. And I took a cartridge, EEPROM, baked it out, mailed it to him. It's like, where does cartridge come from? I made it. It's like, it's a, I saw this game called Crossfire or something like that. It's just a big, um, um, it was a grid, of squares and you moved around and you had to shoot bullets left and right and up and down and you use the blocks to hide. It's kind of like a Sega game called Targ is another one it was kind of based on. And you know the game was of course unfinished but the very fact that it was a fully working demo on a 2600 that in and of itself was an impressive feat. So they then said hey you know what there's someone I want you to meet. Yet another game company wants to get into the Atari 2600, and they don't really want to spend $20,000 to hire an ex-Atari employee, but they're more than happy to drag this poor kid halfway across the country kicking and screaming and have her just teach them. And so I got a phone call from um, Eric, um, I think, I don't know if it was Jack or Eric Dot. I don't remember which one it was, but it was definitely one of those two guys. That um, one's the father, one's the son, I don't remember which is which. Um, said, hey, I heard you can program the 2600. Said, yes, I can. Would you like a job? Sure would. It's better than me, you know, eking out a living over at the JCPenney warehouse. And they're like, great, you're hired. I'm like, I am? Sure. Then the very next day, overnight letter, plane ticket. <laughs> that looks familiar. <laughs> Except this time, it was one way. And I'm like, you know what? I've already been independent from my family for quite some time. I said, what the hell? So I went over, got a steamer trunk, put everything I owned into it, and trust me, getting an Apple II in a steamer trunk was not fun. <laughs> but got that all in there, got onto the, you know, got the plane ticket, went to the airport, flew to Taos, uh, to Baltimore, Maryland, where they picked me up, took me over to Towson, Maryland, and of course they asked me the ever-present question. So great, you're gonna have a job, you're gonna sign these contracts, you're 18, right? <laughs> sure, yeah! <laughs> I've been 18 for several years now. I've got a lot of experience being 18. <laughs> so, they took one look at the card I built and were like, holy hell, <laughs> that's what you use for development? 
yeah, this wire wrap thing that looks like it's basically the flying spaghetti monster vomited all over it with all these wires and chips and stuff. And it says, yeah, Radio Shack. Can you build five more of them? <laughs> On it. <laughs> so built uh, another five more. And then at that point, I went ahead and uh, had to write this document and showed them the source code of the game that I wrote and uh, spoke with the other three programmers they brought in to actually make Atari 2600 games. And that's how the five Atari 2600 games from Avalon Hill came into being. You know, Out of Control, um, see, Death Trap, Wall Ball, London Blitz, and Out of Control. Um, there, thanks to yours truly. <laughs> Now, as I was living in the same house I was working because Avalon Hill thought, hmm, we don't want this asset to get away, so we're going to put her up in a room in the top of this house. The bottom floor of the house was the open air area where we actually did the Atari 2600 development. It, because Avalon Hill really didn't have a office specifically for computer game development. It was mostly done by independent contractors who, or people who just submitted games. So we had this house that the, the, the Dots owned, and I lived in a room upstairs rent-free. And of course, then I asked the ever-present question, um, am I getting paid for this? Sure. I mean, yeah, you're giving me free room, and of course there's food in the refrigerator, so room and board, but I would like to get paid. And they go like, oh, all right. So I was being paid, and I am not kidding, $120 a month. Now, of course, me being the ever-present businesswoman of the 1980s, I was like, cool. <laughs> I mean, I had no clue whatsoever what uh, rent was like, because either I was living with my mom or I was living behind a dumpster, uh, but so, which, of course, both of them are kind of rent-free. Um, but the, I didn't know any better. So I just kept it up. Well, then, a gentleman overheard me when I was talking with another friend of mine about how I was doing things to the Baltimore phone company. And he approached me going like, hey, um, there's a company I know who could use an engineer like yourself. And go like, you've been hearing me? You've been listening to me? I should keep my voice down. But this friend of mine uh, said, hmm, well, it means better than building nuclear weapons because my friend who lived in the Baltimore area, that's what he did for a living, was design and build nuclear weapons. So I know a lot about nuclear weapons that I don't really let on. <laughs> um, but it's like, hey, this guy's offering you a possible job, but with who? And it turned out that it was, of all people, HBO. It was brand new, but they had an idea that they wanted to do a play cable system. That is a set-top box so you can watch HBO and whatever systems they had back then. I think it was just MTV only because when I was working at the HBO office, they had MTV running on the TV screen all the bloody time. If I ever, ever listened to who was a video killed the radio star or pressure one more time, and that's been since 1980, late 81, early 82. I'm like, please let this nightmare end. But they did pay me $500 a week, which of course in 1981 dollars is pretty darn good. Um, and I was writing the software for a cartridge which had a Z80 processor in it, 64K of RAM. Um, it had 4K of ROM in it. And the whole idea is that when you use this board, it will be a set-top box, so you could see whatever cable TV stuff was going on. But if you had an Atari 2600 plugged into it through a cable and a cartridge, it would then allow you to download uh, video games off of the cable <clears throat> and play the video games. Essentially, they were trying to do the equivalent of Stadia back in 1982. Um, so we actually had the prototype running where we were just simply taking like about five or six different 4K games, um, loading them up on this device. But because the device had a Z80 and RAM in it, I created a, a piece of software that had, let's say, text on the screen, and which all the 2600 was doing was just rendering the image, but the text was actually driven by the Z80. So you can actually use it as a terminal. And then, because I was insane, I made a prototype of Tempest 
in which it was drawing all the lines and so forth. That was all in one color. Um, and I thought maybe later on I could use sprites to overlay to do different colors and things like that. But it was used as a demo to show that not only could this thing just play Atari 2600 games, but also enhance them so therefore they can convince developers to make games specifically for this cartridge. So then they would just say, hey, you know, we can have exclusives that, have, you know, that were really better than it was for the Atari 2600. But after working with this company for like three or four months, then they just came by and said, hey, we're canceling us. It's like, what? Yeah, because there's already two companies that are going to be out in the market. Uh, I think a Play Channel or something like that. There was like another company came out with a play cable system. I think it was for Intellivision, and they announced that they were going to do it for Atari. And so it's like, well, they beat us to the market. And secondly, there's this thing called a StarPath Supercharger, which does the thing that you were doing with the Z80, except they do it for a lot cheaper. So I'm like, well, OK. So I experienced my very, very first layoff. <laughs> And so now, here it is, I'm living in New York City, I'm laid off, got my final check, which they didn't give me severance or anything, like just said, here's your paycheck, get out. Um, so I'm like, well, um, what am I gonna do now? I know, I'm gonna go crying home to mama. <laughs> so, use what the money I had, buy a plane ticket, which as you can imagine back then, again, was still very expensive. Flew back to LA, and hey, just showed up at my, my mom's house with my steamer trunk and uh, all my crap, and of course, I accumulated more crap, so I had to mail that back um, in addition to the suitcase I had. And my mom goes like, where have you been? It's like, I don't know. <laughs> so at this point, sitting there going like, hmm, I need a job. So I went onto the bulletin boards because there were a lot of uh, pirates and people who I had very, very good friendships with where you exchange secrets and things like, you know, how to build a nuclear bomb. This is how you do it. <laughs> <laughs> Including other things that even now I'm pretty wondering whether or not I could even disclose that despite the fact it's been 41 years. <laughs> but one of these people was down, who lived down the, uh, Santa Ana area was saying, hey, this company I'm working for called Boom Corporation. You should give them a call. So, okay. Called him up, and a guy named Mike Boone, who was, of all things, a petroleum engineer who decided he wanted to make a golf game on the computer because he met math people, and obviously, math professors know how to write computer games. <laughs> yeah, that, that, that ended up exactly as you're already thinking. But, in order to keep the company afloat, they had this idea of doing games for KTEL Records, yet another company that joined the Atari 2600 fray. They called themselves Zonix, X-O-N-X. -X. And there was a double meaning to it because it was a double-ended cartridge. So therefore, if you flip the cartridge over, it still says Zonix on it. That was their whole shtick. And they had a bunch of Atari 2600 games that they wanted to start porting to the VIC-20 and the Commodore 64, and they needed warm bodies to do this. And I'm like, I could do that. If not, I can learn to do that. I mean, 6502, come on, how hard can it be? can it be? Well, for me, it wasn't that hard because I'm an Atari 2600 programmer, so I would take the tw a game I, I did, Chuck Norris Super Kicks and uh, Robin Hood. Um, for the VIC-20, and then later on I did Chuck Norris for the uh, Commodore 64. And what I did is I just took the 2600 game, played it a bit, then I downloaded the code using that little magic card of mine, and in some cases I just copied and pasted the code, and said, okay, here's all the game logic, I'll just keep that, and I'll just write some new rendering routines. Which, of course, to the other people were like, don't you just simply look at the game and just write the equivalent code? I'm like, why should I do that? I mean, the logic's already there. They already wrote it. So I started my own little port house and invented porting. I'm certain other people have been doing it, but hey, I was doing it myself, which just basically says, write the game, all the generic code in 6502, and has no knowledge whatsoever of what it's running under, and then just write specific drivers for Apple II, C64, VIC-20, et cetera. Well, then that made me the port goddess. And I got dumped with so many games, it was like, okay, here, have another Zonix game. And I'm like, no. I mean, right now in my house, I actually was going through my garage and I found a box and there was like about 50 Zonix games. And I was like, 
You know, it's like, I touched that. <laughs> it touched me. I feel so dirty. <laughs> you know, like, I mean, one of our jokes was like, hey, you better be good or you're going to make you work on a Sonics game. <laughs> so obviously, that was horrible. Well, during my time at Boone comes the infamous tale, the tale of deep, dark horror, the tale that will send shivers through your spine, the tale of, why do people call me burger? <laughs> It was because one day when I was working really, really late on my Apple II with a Titan accelerator and an Axlon RAM drive and this wacky circuitry that I built in order to hook it up to a Commodore 64 or a VIC-20, I was on a roll. And I was like, hmm, this place didn't pay me very well. Definitely wasn't paying me the kind of money at HBO, but you know what? It was enough to make rent and food if I was on a budget. And my budget was that there was a place called Hamburger Stand that would walk from my apartment, walk by Hamburger Stand, which was an offshoot of Wiener Schnitzel where they sold you 29 cent hamburgers. And, you know, so for $2.90, I would have 10 burgers in a bag. And of course, since that blew my budget, I would go into my office, put it in a desk drawer, and whenever I got hungry, lunchtime. <laughs> but, Across from my desk was a gentleman, who I shall keep nameless, who loved to work out, who was really health conscious and was constantly giving me grief about the fact that I was white as a ghost and because of lack of sunlight and skinny as a rail. <laughs> Not anymore. Um, but it was just, con just constantly just ragging on me about how I ate wrong and how I didn't exercise. Well. I was working, Night, the sun set, the sun rose, he comes in from his work day, morning workout, because he always like, gets up at 6 in the morning, and he shows up at the office like 7 or 8 in the morning, you know, and he sits down at his desk, no problem, still working, and then finally, I'm like, oh, what time is it? Oh, 3 o'clock, afternoon, <sighs> it's burger time, and I open up the drawer, Pull the bag, put it right there on my desk, reach in, and got myself one of these well, primo aged burgers. You know, that's the only way to do it in a desk drawer. That's the best way to age them. I then took the burger and started chomping on it as I just sat back at my desk going, like, ugh, maybe I should use the restroom now or something. I don't know. But he then just looks up from his desk, thinks nothing, looks down, looks up from his desk, and then all of a sudden the light bulb came on. Then the meter went tilt. And then his brain just shut down, and he just jumps up. His chair goes flying, and he goes running out the door. And I'm just sitting here going, what's with you? And then I hear him as he's screaming away, going like, that dirt burger is insane, that burger is insane. And that's pretty much all I heard before he was out of earshot. And then I had uh, my boss come in and goes like, what did you do? And I'm like, I don't know, I'm just eating lunch. Well then, so, eat any good burgers lately? <laughs> What's in your drawers? And the jokes just started writing themselves. And at that point, I'm like, fine. Yes, it's a burger. Yes, I like burgers. Fine. OK, and then at that point, I just go, burger. Every time I go, burger. What's for lunch? Burger. You know, what are you, you know, you going to be when you grow up? Burger. <laughs> so. I kept saying the word burger every now and then to the point where my boss got so tired of it that he started saying, you know what? You say burger one more time, I'm going to lop your head off. And I'm like, burger. <laughs> <laughs> so as a joke, he had our staff artist, a guy named David Lowry, draw this picture of Mike Boone wearing a beanie in a suit and tie lopping my head off with an ax. <laughs> and he had that put on my Apple II, so that, because at this time, I was at home sleeping, and as soon as I came in, I turned on my Apple II, and it boots up and just shows that picture on the screen. And you're like, oh, okay, it's subtle hint. <laughs> Burger. <laughs> but then, joke's on you, I copy that file and put it away. So then when Boone Corporation shut down, we then were all sitting around the table going like, well, we're unemployed now. 
What are we going to do? Um, let's form our own company. What the hell? Hence, Interplay was born. <laughs> so the four of us, uh, with an investor, uh, went down to 883 Production Place, rented out the place, and became Interplay. And our, one of our first contracts was a game called Mind Shadow and Tracer Sanction. We started developing the games already, but then once the games were up in prototype stage, we sold them to Activision. I think it was like 100 grand is what we got for them. Uh, which, of course, you know, in 1983 dollars, because it was like October, November 83 was when we founded Interplay. <laughs> that was enough money to pay back our investor and make him go away, which is interesting because um, our CEO is Brian Fargo, and our investor is, and I'm not kidding, Chris Wells. So the Wells Fargo jokes, they write themselves. <laughs> So at that point, we then just started writing the games, and I thought, you know what? I'm going to put that picture in Mind Shadow. I'm going to put that picture in Tracer Sanction, too. So I made certain that, oh, I don't have enough space in a disk. Hmm, I'm time to research compression algorithms. <laughs> and sure enough, I figured out how to put enough space in that disk to put those pictures in there. So therefore, if you were to start up Mind Shadow on the Apple II or Commodore 64, when you're at the title screen, type in the word burger. <laughs> and all of a sudden, pfft, that picture shows up. <laughs> and it's like, why? I'll never tell. <laughs> but the real thing was is that I already started getting a feeling over the time that I wasn't getting a recognition for the games I was working. Until you heard me talk about it, you probably may not even have known Robin Hood or Chuck Norris Super Kicks or um, you know, Final Eclipse games that I worked on beforehand because the games are always put up saying, written by Boom, written by this. And of course, Interplay, we were going to do the same thing. It was going to be, this game's by Interplay. And we're like, no. I made this game. I created this engine. I created the, the graphic editor. I created all these tools. I need credit. So I'm going to put this little thing, I'm going to sign it. I even went one more stage further, which is another little uh, Easter egg I put in, is that in the game Tracer Sanction, Borrowed Time, Task Times in Tone Town, and uh, Mind Shadow, if you're playing the game, and it's, it's a text, graphic text adventure, so you can type in two words or whatever, like get lamp, that kind of stuff. You type in the word burger. In each one of the games, you will die a horrible death. <laughs> It will say, a crazed management type comes running in and lops your head off, which is, of course, the first one. The next one goes like, you hear some rustling in the next room. And then a crazed management type comes running in with a bloodstained axe. You quickly duck. But it's too late. He lops your head off with one clean sweep. <laughs> um, and, and just like, I just could doing that in all my other games, which I would put it that you type in the word burger or to like control B if I couldn't fit that in there, either put in that picture or it would have some text in there which is totally nonsensical. But it came, it came handy because like uh, present day, I mean, if some people are trying to say, you didn't work on Bart's Tale, then please explain why is it when you go to the mad god Tarjan's uh, temple and you tell the priest burger, they say, thou has uttered the most unholy word, prepare to die. And then they give you 99 berserkers, 99 and this, and it's like some horrible fight, which you have to be like almost godlike being to survive. And of course, me being the smart ass bitch I am, the game goes, hmm, let's try again. And it gives you another group of creatures uh, that are even worse. And if you somehow survive that, the temple gods will just throw you out of the building saying, never say that word again. Now, of course, granted, if you're like level 20 or higher characters, it's a great way to level up because you go in there and just murder these things and get all the experience points. But, you know, if you're anything less below 20, then you basically just signed your character's death warrants. But it means that anybody who tries to say, Becky didn't work on Barstale, explain that. Why is that in there? So we now go to... The, in order for Interplay to survive during those first years, first years, writing games like Mind Shadow, Tracer Sanction, Borrow Time, those did bring in money, but as you can imagine, creating a game from scratch takes time. 
because writing the engine, that took me like about a month or two to actually write the engine, then another month or two to write the actual tools to do the editing of the levels. But then somebody has to draw all the art, somebody has to actually write all the text and so forth. Now I did some of that, but in this case, this is where other people came in. But while they're doing that, I'm kind of idle. So this is when I started doing what I eventually called Burger Lib. Remember how I told you when I was doing my first Atari 2600 to C64 conversions? I remembered very clearly that all you have to do to write a cross-platform game is to write the game in a virtual machine in which you want to draw a font, just call a font call class, but you make no assumptions whatsoever of the machine you're running on. You don't know if it's an Apple II, Commodore 64, or an Atari 800. So when I wrote Mind Shadow in Tracer Sanction, I wrote it so that the game engine was in one part of the code, uh, in the memory map, and the drivers that actually did the work was in another part of the memory map. And of course, the rest of the memory map was just the actual data of the game, which by the way, is the same data. There is no change. Literally, the data that's used in, let's say, Mind Shadow for the Commodore 64 and the Apple II, it's the same data. So therefore, once the artists or the writers and stuff like that created all these assets, all I had to do was just simply say, compile the main code, and then here's the Atari version of the library, link that in, or the Apple II version of the library, or the Commodore 64 version of the library. So as a result, when I finished Mind Shadow, you know, for the Apple II and got it ready for distribution, their first reaction was, okay, you're gonna take three months, six months to do the Commodore 64 version. And it says, compile, here's your C64 version. Oh, here, compile, here's your Atari version. And like, what? I said, no, here's, here's the Atari version. It's like, really? Yeah, really. So they then thought, hey, maybe uh, she can help doing other ports. So they brought in, um, Interplay was trying to get in bed with Electronic Arts. So at first, you know, we were an unproven studio. Yeah, we did some graphic adventures for Atari. Uh, no, sorry, Activision, sorry, brain fart, Activision. Um, but we really knew that Electronic Arts was where the real money was going to be. But Electronic Arts needed to give us a test. So they said, we have this game called Racing Destruction Set. It's currently on the Commodore 64, but we need an Atari 800 version of it. Can you do it? He says, sure, why not? So took the code, did my magic, stripped out the, thankfully they gave me the source code, so it was not a problem, stripped out all the C64 specific stuff, turned it into, converted it to Burger Lib, did a few little tricks in order to get the game graphics to work as better than, as best as I can on the Atari 800, and I did the port. And of course, you know, as usual, they would say, hey, um, by Interplay Productions, no mention of my name whatsoever. But Electronic Arts behind the scene was saying, we know you wrote this, so here's an award. So we actually had, they gave me an award saying, I know, you know, Heinemann was the one who wrote Atari, to the version of Racing Destruction Set, which I donated the award to the National Video Game History Museum. But it's like, if anybody says, well, how do we know that you wrote this? Well, for one, I have the source code. Number two, there, I have a Ship It Award sitting in a museum right now. But it also kind of reinforced the fact that I needed to keep signing my work if I didn't do that because people may start taking credit or just erasing the credit for me over time. So after doing these uh, Atari 2600 space, I'm oh, sorry, after doing Racing Destruction Set, then we were doing, um, going to do borrowed time. But the trouble was at borrowed time, they wanted to have a better copy protection scheme that we did for um, Mind Shadow and Tracer Sanction. So I said, all right, challenge accepted. I came up with a copy protection scheme, created master disks, they booted up for borrowed time, sent it to Activision, and they immediately came back and says, your copy protection is so good, none of our duplication houses can copy this. <laughs> So um, I said, what's the phone number of your copy duplication house? It says, here's uh, the one we use in LA. So I went down there, and they immediately said, how much will you, uh, do you want for us to create a uh, copy protection turnkey system? So here it is. I'm sitting at my desk with one of those giant um, 
floppy disk dispensers that they use to actually mass produce um, uh, floppy disks. And I learned how to program that thing. And then I learned how to write the wacky copy protection scheme I had. And then I just said, here's the software. Here's the turnkey thing. There you go. So now I um, understand I'm some like 25% of all copy protected software out there for the Apple II is actually one of my techniques. I had some like 10 of them. So you pick which one you want. You want this one? This is crazy. This is even saying this is bloody insane. Which one do you want? And okay, they, of course, you know, sold those things. I think Roland Gustafsson, I think his last name, I'm probably zapping. I think he's the only one who probably did more uh, copy protection techniques than I did. Um, he was with EA. But doing all these things was just constantly learning all these different platforms. Because in time came the Macintosh, the Amiga, the Atari ST. PCs finally became a thing for gaming. They were, you know, while they came out in 81, they really weren't a thing for gaming until like 85, 86, until, you know, EG, oh, sorry, Tandy 16 bit color, 16 colors was a thing. Then it was starting to be taken seriously as a uh, gaming console. And I kept with that knowledge of saying, write a shared library, write the game code, assuming you're using a library, and then um, instant port. And as such, at Interplay, I became the port maven, in which at, uh, we formed this group called MacPlay. And I ended up porting something like 30 to 35 games to the Mac, uh, the most famous ones being Wolfenstein 3D. Um, let's see, what was it? Uh, uh, Sin, Heavy Metal Fact 2, um, you know, Half-Life, <laughs> which is that and is a story in and of itself. Um, the Quake 2, um, so forth, but all these different, you know, just, just kept churning out Jazz Drag Rabbit 2, just churning out game after game after game on the Mac, and then later on I was churning out game after game after game on the PC and so forth, and then of course there was this machine called the Apple IIGS. In 1985, late 85, I just finished the game Task Times and Tone Town for the Apple II, C64, the Atari version was never shipped because at that time the Atari market was pretty much dead. Thank you, pirates. <laughs> yeah, ask uh, the guy who wrote Mule, uh, or in this case, the girl who wrote Mule, about the 5,000 copies of Mule she sold on the Atari 800, where it was the number one selling game on the Atari. That should tell you everything. <laughs> well, Task Times in Tone Town was done, and Apple came out with this brand new prototype. Shh, it's a secret called Cortland, and Cortland was the prototype, what we now know today as the Apple IIGS. And me being the respect, you know, the, uh, the interplay Apple II goddess, I got to play with it. And of course, as soon as I'd fire the thing up and go like, oh my god, the 65816 instructions said, where have you been? And then I saw the, 16, the, the 320 by 200 graphics mode, where have you been? And then, I played the music on this thing because it had an Ensonic 5503 audio chip with 64K of dedicated RAM, which, which at the time was unheard of. Because even though at the, you know, in this time the Amiga was what was considered the, the god of audio because it had four DMA channels to play four simultaneous tones without any CPU intervention. So they thought, that's the shits. This thing had 32 voices, its own memory. So you can actually start up the tones and it will, it will play 32 voices at the same time, zero CPU usage, zero memory usage. And it's like, I must, must use this. So I grabbed the art that we were doing for the Amiga version of Task Times and Tone Town, converted it over to the 2GS in an afternoon, and I had, by about three days later, the 2GS version of Task Times in Tone Town. Fully running, fully operational, all windows and everything like I did for the Amiga version. But I needed music instead of the Apple II. Beep, beep, pop, pop. No, that wasn't going to cut it. So went over to Activision, found Russell Lieblick, who was a resident musician. I said, would you like to do a song on this chip? And he just said, let me get a napkin to, call, you know, to clean up my drool. And 
we then sat there in his um, studio for two weeks where he composed the actual notes, sampled the instruments, and came together for everything we needed to be able to play those songs that we have in Task Times and Tone Town. I was busy actually writing the music driver, figuring out how to upload the, the waveforms, and because he had large waveforms, I had to figure out how to upload and download waveforms on the fly. So I was doing stuff that was even really, really advanced in order to be able to get this music to work as well as it did. Once it was done, we had, okay, ship this game. So here's the game, it's on a three and a half inch disc. Fire it up and then go like da 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 and the people were both floored at this music that was being played. And I'm like, you like it? <laughs> and well, let's put it this way. The game was the hottest selling game of the Apple IIGS. It came out as the IIGS was shipping. So we, the moment the IIGSs were unveiled on um, at all these Apple stores and so forth, and that wasn't the Apple stores, they say like, they had Apple sections in many computer stores at the time and they had this big unveiling event. And then from what I heard, 90% of them, they fired up Task Times and Tone Town to show off the audio capabilities of the Apple IIGS. So I was kind of partially responsible for the initial uh, bump in sales of the Apple IIGS. And I loved programming that machine so much, I ended up programming, I think about 10 to 12 games on it. Um, and in fact, I even kept programming games on it to that uh, even though the game, the, uh, the Apple IIGS market died in around 1992, I think it was, 92, 93, where nobody was carrying IIGS software anymore. Um, I did this game called Out of This World by showing a tech demo of it on a IIGS, which allowed them me to get permission to do a Super Nintendo version, which was, by the way, developed on a IIGS. And once the 2GS version, I'm oh, sorry, the Super Nintendo version of Out of This World shipped, I then spent another week, finished up the Apple 2GS version, and I contacted this company called the Big Red Computer Club, in which they were doing a business where they were contacting companies, buying up canceled 2GS games, finishing the games, or taking, the games are already finished, they just were never shipped, and started shipping them. And I said, hey, you know, to, I told my boss over at Interplay, um, Big Red Computer Club would like to sell the 2GS version of Out of This World. And of course, he was like, <laughs> Who, what, like five copies are going to be sold? Um, so he says, sure, we'll do it, but they have to buy a thousand copies in advance, full wholesale price, which our wholesale price at the time was like $25, um, $25 $30, something like that. So they're basically asking these people to write a check for $25 to $30,000. And uh, very shortly, there was a check for $25,000, $30,000. And so, of course, you know, my boss like, hey, they're lost. So then we had, I got a play tester, an actual play tester, to play the game through, verify the game was finished, and so forth. We found a few little minor bugs, fixed them, and then it went to duplication and went out the door. Because, I mean, hey, you know, when you get a for, check for $25,000, it's like, yeah, we're going to give you a white glove service. And so, of course, he comes in and says, look, we got $25,000, cool, not bad for a couple weeks' work. He says, not bad. And then a few months later, he comes into my office again, he's like, you're never going to believe this. What? They ordered another 1,000 copies. <laughs> <laughs> Which, of course, for us is just pure profit, and you know, we still manufactured them and so forth um, and sent them off. So there's about 2,000 copies of the 2GS version of Out of This World out there. So this... The reason I even bring this up was because it means that I'm the poor bitch who was the one who wrote the very first and the very last commercial Apple II GS games. <laughs> and of course, then later on I released Ultima 1, and then there was a Wolfenstein 3D for the 2GS, but those are more like into the shareware market and kind of like that. Um, I'm here down to almost 11 minutes here, so I'm going to open up the questions because I kind of rambled on all over the place about my career and the video game tournament. So, you have a question. I'll be your first question again. Uh, oh. All right, so, ooh, how about I aim over here? Uh, after the 2GS, uh, you were gonna start the 3DO stories, maybe? Uh, so, my question is tied to this and the 6502. From the designer of the systems standpoint, 
uh, Sophie and Ferber designed the arm to be the spiritual successor of the 6502. Yep. You've written 6502, and obviously the 3DO contains an arm. Mm -hmm. How well do you feel they did at spiritually successing the machine, and did you enjoy writing arm code, and did it, like, did it spark feelings of you know, 6502 coding and stuff like that. Oh, I was home. Um, the question really is just how, you know, the 65, the, the ARM CPU was technically upon by its design, the spiritual successor of 6502, 6516. And I will say, it, they nailed it. They absolutely nailed it. it was a, in fact, it, my opinion is had Apple not canceled 2GS and actually kept going with the line, they would have probably come out with the Mark Twain machine, which is a, a souped up 2GS with a hard drive built into it. But I would have pretty much assumed that its successor would have been an ARM-based machine because it would have been trivial to write a 6502 emulator in ARM to be able to run the old code while using a new 32-bit machine to move forward. Um, to example of this, I posted up on GitHub about five or six years ago the entire source code to Doom that I did for 3DO you will find that Burger Lib there was written in ARM assembly. And it was because it was like trivial for me to con uh, convert 6502 code line by line right into ARM, just that I have 32-bit registers instead of uh, 16 from the 65816. Uh, yes, you have a question? Yes, I still write in ARM today. Uh, so how far down the road did you keep porting Burger Lib to new systems? Go to GitHub, old school, slash BurgerLib. BurgerLib5 is up there, and I just updated it like about a week ago. <laughs> um, except that BurgerLib today, and it doesn't support the 2GS anymore because it requires a minimum of 32-bit CPU, but it runs on 22 platforms. Um, most notably, the Switch, the Wii, the Wii U, the PlayStation 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, um, Xbox One, Xbox 360, uh, and of course, Android, uh, iOS, and all the, the Linux, all their platforms. In fact, the only new target now is uh, being put together is Stadia. So, so you invented Unity before Unity, basically. Well, better. I think the closest analogy is SDL. Because BurgerLib is not a game engine. It was never designed to be a game engine. It's designed to be an operating system in which you write your code on this operating system in a virtual environment in the sense that the file names are all consistent, the setting up of video is consistent, so it's kind of like SDL. The difference is that I support all these platforms and I actually have a server rack in my garage that every time I do a check-in, it builds it on those 22 platforms. So I still know it works on the Vita, I know it works on the Xbox 360 because otherwise I get a report saying, you broke the Xbox 360 version. Okay. <laughs> Next question. Just curious, I, I had no clue you worked on Avalon Hill at all. Did you have any like cross pollination into the like the computer side of it, where there were Apple II games and all sorts of other? Um, I stuff? helped that a little bit on the game called Talon Guard, um, but right now I actually, because of my time in Avalon Hill, um, I uh, once reconnected to my friend who worked there named William Volk, and he and I were actually working together on a game of his design on um, iOS called uh, Word Topics which is available right now. So if you go to Android or iOS game stores, you should find word topics from old school. And that's William Volk. And he was from Avalon Hill back then, and that's how we met. <laughs> Your question? Um, earlier, you were talking about you know, crediting yourself through Easter eggs when it wasn't you know, acceptable to credit directly. Um, could you comment on how that's been going in the you know, modern game development? Well, in modern game development, um, I know like some companies I used to work at, they actually had policies that if you put an Easter egg in there that wasn't clear by legal, you were terminated. Um, it is possible to put Easter eggs, but it has to be something that's done with a team effort. But then again, I mean, game developed back in the 70s, 80s, and 90s was that the team was like four people tops. So it's easy to just simply sneak an Easter egg in and no one would ever know. 
but now you have teams in which there's anywhere from 100 to 200 devs using a source control system. So the moment, and they do like um, code reviews. So as soon as you write the code and put it in there, somebody's gonna say, why did you put code that looks for the word burger in here? And then they're gonna have to ask you know, some crazy questions. So sneaking stuff like that in is a lot harder. Not impossible, but you really have to have buy-in from uh, the company uh, Big Wigs. I got six minutes left, so let's make these good ones. Anybody else have a question? Ah, yes, you again. I'll go again if, uh, if I'm allowed. <laughs> the year is 1992. Mm -hmm. The 2GS did not die. Yeah. <laughs> We're in an alternate universe. ARM is starting to happen, and you have a choice of going with ARM or 65816. Oh, I would have gone, take gone straight to the ARM. Gone straight to the ARM. Because for me, the, the ARM to me is the, spirit, is the successor of 65816. Um, I talked with Bill Mensch back then about his ideas of the 65832, in which, because mm. it was pretty obvious back then, especially with the dawn of the, 380, the 386 and so forth, about 32 bit CPUs, that to continue on the 6502 had to move to 32-bit. And his idea of the 6832 was basically just do the 6516, but with 32-bit registers, but really nothing more. And I was very disappointed with those designs. But then when I saw what ARM was coming out with, with the Archimedes computer, I believe it was, I could be wrong. That and the uh, PC. And then, of course, the 3DO. Um, once I started working on 3DO and saw the ARM assembly language, I was immediately hooked and, you know, because I was like 93, 94 when I started working, which of course the 2 just was still technically around. Yeah. Um, but I would have saw that had Apple itself not shot the 2GS in the knees and stopped its fr uh, further development, I could have easily seen an Apple 2GS uh, plus or, you know, two or whatever they want to call them, uh, with an ARM CPU and gone the same route they did with the Mac to the Power PC, they would have done something like that except to the ARM, and then the Apple II would have been a very low-cost um, ARM-based computer with those wonderful slots, and it would have taken over education. But that's in an alternate universe, so where's Doctor Strange? <laughs> Open a portal, get me out of here! <laughs> Okay, time for one more question. Very quick. Any chance you have any code for Star Trek Secret of Vulcan Fury kicking around your server somewhere? A definite maybe. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, go ahead. First, a quick note that you're, you're absolutely right that the Archimedes was the first uh, ARM machine. And I, yes, a, a, an ARM in a 2GS would be awesome. Um, and the emulation you suggested did in fact exist on the Archimedes because Acorn's previous machine was also 6502, and they, they shipped an emulator for that. It worked in real time on their arm. Mm -hmm. But the question, uh, the question is, what can you tell us about optimizing out of this world? I mean, it was, it had, it was vector graphics in real time on a, on a, on a CPU that was barely 16-bit. Um, how did you do that? Okay, the Apple II, okay, the 65816 instruction set is far more powerful than people give it credit for. Because of the fact that you had the ability to change the bank registers. Now on the 65816, there was a register called K, which is the instruction pointer, and a register called B, which is the bank register for your data, and then finally, the Apple II GS, as well as the Super Nintendo, you can actually modify the memory addresses so you can move, like say, the video screen to bank zero. So you can move the stack. So with this, I could have data being read from 164K bank being written to the video, which is essentially the remapped stack. And the stack instructions like push A, pull A, PEI, those instructions essentially became my new blit instructions. So instead of saying load A with 0005, you know, memory address, and then do the actual memory read, which will be four clocks, three for the instruction, one for the read, I now reduced it to a push A instruction. So one instruction for the, put, the write, and the instruction itself, and then the next two clocks is writing memory. 
And then, of course, they had the indexed by stack instruction, which is 1 comma s, 3 comma s, whatever. That allowed me to even go further so that if I was doing a sprite write, um, what a technique I call compiled sprites, I could just say, OK, push A, push A, write to 6 comma s, 12 comma s, 14 comma s, and then Act, you know, then I can add to the stack pointer and go to another location or read from. So with this, I actually was able to write very, very small memory instructions in order for me to move the uh, memory a lot quicker than just doing load A, store A, increment X, branch if not equal, repeat. Um, and then lastly, I had the ability to, um, the PEI instruction, had the ability for me to read from one bank to another bank. So as I was copying, basically it became a faster MVN instruction um, for copying you know, memory from one video buffer to another. Um, and that was what really helped me get the code running as fast as possible on 16 based computers. And I think we're out of time. So follow me on Twitter, Twitch, Bur uh, whatever. It's Burger Becky, B-U-R-G-E-R-B-E-C-K-Y. Um, my company is old school, O-L-D-E-S-K-U-U-L. And I hope to see you again some other time soon. <laughs>